What I want to do um, this afternoon is to uh, take you on a slightly different perspective uh, and look at what it really means to be a safe clinician. Um, we often see that uh, from our hallowed halls and our colleges, but we, when we actually have a look at what happens to our clinicians, it's a little bit like this picture. This is not your typical lighthouse picture sat up on a bluff overlooking the beautiful sea. This is five days after a cyclone off the coast of France and the photographer Jean Guillard flew by helicopter around to take some photographs. Uh, and you probably can just make out the lighthouse keeper who actually came outside to see what on earth the noise was and what was the helicopter doing out there in such weather. You might also notice that uh, there's a bicycle. Uh, what do you do with a bicycle on a lighthouse? You go round and round in circles. <laughs> but this is what it's really like to be a clinician. To be at the coalface with young people who are trying to do something for patients when they're really not quite sure of what's happening around them. And in our emergency departments, the churn of new people coming through the door makes it very difficult for them to concentrate on the simple things that they were taught in medical school or as a trainee. And so I want us to think about what does it really mean to be safe and how can we be sure that we're a safe surgeon. And I began to think, if I talk about aviation, everyone's going to go, oh, no. If I talk about the railways, someone's going to say, here he goes again, that's his passion. If I talk about the mining industry, people are going to say, but we're not miners. Or if I talk about the nuclear industry, people say, he's going to knock Japan. And, and on and on it goes, because we all want to accept the fact that we are different in our own environment, and those things don't apply to us. We've actually studied all of those industries, six industries in all, and in fact, their approach to safety is the same as ours ought to be. But today, I actually want to take you to a different space, a space where you've all been and probably still are. I actually want to take you to the gutter I want to take you to a particular gutter. It was in Penshurst Street, Willoughby, on the north, lower north shore of Sydney. I was a boy of eight. There'd been a crash at an intersection about halfway down the hill. A truck and a car were involved. All the ambulances and the sirens and everything was going, so my, myself and my little brother ran down to the corner. And there was blood, there was mess, there was blanket over what was obviously a body. But about 50 yards down the hill in the gutter, over next to one of those little culverts that you drive over to get in and out of your driveway over the gutter, there was another small piece of cloth over what was obviously a head, because the person had been decapitated when they went underneath the truck. It left an indelible pressure, um, impression on me as a young boy, and I determined to become a safe driver. How many of you have got a licence? Fantastic. How many of you have done an advanced driver course? It's not too bad. There's a great opportunity for the rest of you. How many of you have gone back to be recertified as a driver? Fantastic. Advanced driver training? Truck driver? Bus driver? Change countries. There you go. <laughs> um, yes, I've done it to drive a community bus. But you see, we don't actually think too clearly about these things. We, we put some processes around and we think in, in health we can be a little bit different and we can take the high ground. But we are actually in the same space as those of us who have to drive. So what I want to do today is just use some of the principles around road safety programs and around surgical safety programs to show you that this is actually core business. It's not really all that difficult. It does work, and they're the three messages that comes out of this afternoon's presentation, I hope. This is just a little table of some of the things I thought I could talk about. I clearly cannot do all of them. I'll let you find the spelling mistake. I'm not going to talk much about the first uh, panel there, the driver, uh, knowledge-based, skills-based, licensing, advanced driver skills, safe surgery, knowledge-based, skills-based, credentialing, uh, continued medical education. We've been talking about some of those things already. I do want to focus on some of the issues around risk in both the roads and in our clinical uh, environment. Say a few words about risk prevention. Have just a brief 
foray into the mind of our passengers, but also then to think about how we influence the rest of the community. That is our professional community, the management community that we work with, and also the community at large. The first thing I did was to go to the Roads and Traffic Authority in New South Wales and get some statistics. I was amazed at the huge volume of statistics that you can get from them. Did you know that they can tell you the average speed, 500, 300, 200, 100 metres from a speed camera? And they can show you how the closer you get to the speed camera, at around about 300 metres, you all slow down. <laughs> and about 300 metres past, you all go back up. <laughs> they had the figures. They can show you the angles of impact of all the vehicles at intersections and where crashes have occurred. But they put this graph up in their uh, file a few years ago now, and they've updated with tables, but not with files, so I've left this graph for you. These are the road traffic fatalities in New South Wales from 1934. 1934, they started compiling death statistics to 2003. When did we in surgery start compiling death statistics? When did we in anaesthesia start doing it? Around about 50 years ago, it so happens for the anaesthetists. What about the rest of our clinical professions? Some are still thinking about doing it. But you can see there the spikes. And I wonder if you were to think about what those spikes might represent. By the way, the two figures on the uh, right are 2008 and 2011 provisional statistics. And you can see that in 2011 we had the lowest road traffic uh, fatality uh, level since 1934. We've done something right on our roads. Have we done the same thing right in our clinical endeavours? But what was it that triggered the falls? Now, I'm sure some of you will say, oh, well, uh, seat belts, yes. Uh, road, uh, random breath test, yes. A, a very pronounced road traffic strategy, yes. But have a look at when the fall occurred. The fall occurred before those things were mandated. Why? Because for months beforehand, the press and the communities were saying, we have to do something about this. And the conversation started. So by the time they introduced seatbelts, many of us had already fitted them. I had a little Morris Minor, but it had seatbelts. <laughs> Saved my neck, actually, in a car accident. Got hit from behind. Would have gone to the windscreen, except I had a seatbelt on. Before they became compulsory. The same thing with random breath tests. The fall occurred in the months before it became compulsory. That's not to say it should not be compulsory, but it's to show that by discussing what's the right thing to do, we begin to introduce a sense of change for good. The question is, can we do the same thing in our clinical endeavours? And I apologise for referring to New South Wales and to surgery, but they're the things that I know most about. Uh, but I just want to show you some of them. Here's another statistic. In 2011, the general fatalities on our roads fell by 7%. The fatalities due to heavy vehicles rose by 21%. And there were 61 deaths due to trucks. I drive down to the Southern Highlands from Sydney on a regular basis. Just four weeks ago, a truck crossed the median strip, went through a safety barrier, into a car coming the other way and squashed it and killed three people instantly. They didn't even have a chance to apply the brakes, according to the people that came behind them. Why tell you that? Who are the most experienced drivers on our roads? The truck drivers. Who are the professional drivers? Our truck drivers. And yet while we were making an impact on fatalities, theirs was going up. Why should that be? Fatigue. The roads, drugs, alcohol, yes, uh, GFC <laughs> causes everything. Let me just tell you about that truck driver. Just two weeks ago, after the accident, he was in court where he was fined $300 for a previous traffic infringement before the fatality had occurred. And it came out in that court case that he'd had his driver's licence suspended multiple times. I think it was five for major road traffic infringements. And yet he was allowed to keep driving 
until he killed three people. What about in our clinical endeavours? What do we do to make sure that things are safe? There's no doubt about it that road traffic accidents are seen to be a public health issue. Governments devote time to them. Newspapers devote time to them. We have research institutes in all our states. But what about surgery? I'm going to quote this afternoon from the New England Journal of Medicine by Haynes and Al, and also from some of the WHO data about safe surgery. I'm not going to read all this to you. You can get this on the web, or you may even have the manual in front of you at home. But we all know that there are far more people who die as a result of medical misadventure in our hospitals, in our aged care facilities, in our operating rooms, in our outpatients, than ever drive on the roads. What are we doing to try and make sure that we as professionals are improving our lot? I would like to suggest that there are some things that we are doing and we can do a lot better. The first is we can compile the statistics, called in the, in the lingo feedback. We can let people know just how fast they're going. The truck that I mentioned to you had its speed limiter turned off. So there was no warning to that driver that he was driving at more than 100 kilometres an hour, which was the legal limit for trucks. So often we don't have any speed limiter on our clinical practice until disasters occur. This is just some of the figures that we've compiled just uh, the last few weeks in New South Wales on our Collaborating Hospitals Audit of Surgical Mortality. In 2011, there were 1,795 deaths under the care of a surgeon, whether or not they'd had an operation. 975 surgeons had reported those deaths and returned form to the CASM Central Committee. It's not a mandated process Le legally. It is ethically. And participating in surgical audit, to ANZASM in particular, of which we're part, is mandated by the college. But 46% of our surgeons didn't bother. They turned off the speed limiter. They didn't know how well they were performing. The figure's probably not as bad as that because it does include some surgeons like myself who no longer operate. Um, but nevertheless, we still haven't got this to be 100% pr provision of information on what we're doing. And when we do that, have a look at some of the topics that we find. A vascular cause of lower abdominal pain, two cases. These are in a booklet that we produced and distributed to all surgeons in New South Wales. A case where supervision was non-existent. Another case where there were two separate abdominal pathologies. A case where we failed to recognise and manage a deteriorating patient. Perforated viscous. Failure to transfer quickly enough. Failure to hand over at a consultant level appropriately. The use of narcotic analgesia in the elderly, and on it goes, 18 cases in that particular volume. The previous volume had 11 cases that related to aspiration pneumonia. And for the first time, surgeons in New South Wales started to say to us, we've just realised that aspiration pneumonia is a surgical complication, not just an anaesthetic one. Professor Baker will be pleased to know. Because we got some feedback, we, we looked at the data, we looked at the speedometer to see just how fast we were going, and we got some information, but we haven't got enough. Somebody mentioned fatigue. We have a Stop, Revive, Survive program. Now, be honest, how many of you stop every two hours and have a cup of coffee? And yet we know fatigue kills, and we have our kids in the back seat, and our wife next to us and the dog on the floor. We don't do anything about what we know to be a common problem on the roads. So is it any wonder then that we don't do anything about fatigue when we come to have a look at the behaviour of our clinicians, particularly, I have to say, our senior clinicians? I've been there, I know how to do it. These young guys, they just haven't got the stamina. You can work through it all. I'm sorry, the evidence doesn't say that. There was a lot of work done on fatigue through the AMA and the college. A very extensive paper, which I'm not going to quote here, but you can see the depth of the work that's been uh, put out there. 
It does admit that access to healthcare facilities has to be on a 24-hour basis, but not at the cost of burnout or risk to the health of those providing the service or the safety of their patients. What is the definition of safe? You thought about that? What's the definition of safe? I'll tell you what, there's about 13 or 14 uh, in the dictionaries that I, <coughs> pardon me, that I consulted. One of them was to be secure in the absence of harm. To know that harm is not going to occur. I thought that's not a bad definition, actually. It's probably, algebra, probably a little bit too perfect. But there was another one that worried me. It said to be non-threatened by harm. In the clinical sphere, we are often non-threatened by harm because it's not us who gets hurt. And we get gung-ho and we perform in ways that are not safe. So what do we do about it? Well, the college and the AMA documents made it quite clear. There needs to be cooperation and negotiation between all parties involved in the provision of surgery. When are we going to do this case? When are we not going to do this case? Surgeons in particular, or proceduralists, should be aware of the cumulative hazard of sleep and rest deprivation and take measures to avoid it. And they're spelled out in the AMA National Code of Practice. We should not be working more than 24 hours in a, uh, 14 hours in a row. There should be less than f uh, 10 continuous hours break per 24 hour period. Inadequate rest periods during work. These are all things that make us unsafe. And the work from Drew Dawson in the University of South Australia has shown that you can recognise and manage sleep and still get the work done. Power naps in a quiet room or in a cubicle, as happens in some hospitals in Queensland, enables you to recharge the batteries and continue with less impairment. Let me ask you a question. Who believes you should be allowed to operate with a blood alcohol level of more than 0 0.05? Drew has shown quite convincingly that in 25-year-old subjects that your performance after 25 hours of non-interrupted work are equally impaired as a person who's DUI. And yet we encourage our trainees to work hard because we want them to be just like us. And besides, we can cope. The physiology of ageing tells me otherwise. We do need to think about this. Our road campaigns are now saying there are signs of tiredness. Are you yawning when you drive? Have a look in the tea room and see how many people are yawning or dozing off. Have you got tired eyes or red eyes? Are you blinking a lot? These are signs that you should stop driving. And there are signs that you should stop operating or encourage somebody else to stop doing the procedure or making decisions. And we need to work as a team to introduce a different view of safety in our clinical endeavours, just as we have on the roads. By the way, who funds the Stop Revive programs? The governments? People who've been, been involved in road accidents very commonly, supported by the National Roads and Motors uh, uh, Authorities and, and WA. People who've seen the harm that fatigue can cause. So who's going to do it in our work on the wards? Fatigue is a real problem in the airline industry, which is why they have very strict rules. I've been grounded because a pilot wouldn't complete the flight on time. It's a pain in the neck, but I wasn't complaining. But I was talking to one such pilot just a few days ago, um, and he was telling me the story of one of his partner who's quite seriously in the hospital and had a procedure, uh, and he was quite worried. Uh, this guy's a very senior Czech pilot. He said, you know, I talked to them and I said, to her, when's she going to be done? And they said, oh, she's number four on the list, but they've been some long cases this morning. Um, I said, I probably won't be about two or three o'clock this afternoon. He said, oh, well, that's OK, so she'll stop for lunch, will she? Oh, no, no, she'll work through. What was she doing last night? Oh, well, she was on call last night. I'm not sure if she operated or not. My friend was really, really worried because that wouldn't be allowed in the airline industry. But we take this as a sign of being macho uh, in our clinical endeavours. But then he just happened to say, oh, we have to get some sustenance before we fly. I said, I'm sorry, Peter, what do you mean? He said, well, we have to have something to eat before we fly. 
And they usually give us sandwiches, something with some starch and some glucose and some other good things in it, because they want us to be at our peak performance in that hour after takeoff. What do we do about the sustenance of our colleagues? We've closed the cafeterias down, so that's one good start. We've taken the peanut butter and bread out of the tea rooms, haven't we, Bruce? <laughs> Great loss, but you can see why I did such a good job when we were growing up. But we have to understand that there are other factors that impact the safety which we can influence. And sustenance, or the physical well-being of our staff, does impact on safety. The other thing, of course, that causes so many car accidents is speeding. And you've all seen this ad, I'm sure. Just some of the figures from New South Wales. In 2002, uh, 561 deaths, 46% of them due to speeding. 2009, same percentage. Over five years, around about 40%. We know that speeding kills. And yet people still speed. We have speed cameras to catch them out, and we know that slows them down for about 600 metres. When they're being watched, they go slower. You know what it's like on a holiday weekend when you see the boys in blue on the freeway, you slow down, you think, I wonder if they're going to follow me, and you, you watch the next kilometre, make sure they're not behind you. We need to understand that surveillance of the way in which we work in our hospitals will also have some beneficial effect. For instance, sepsis. In New South Wales, in this calendar year, we can expect 9,000 people to develop severe blood-borne sepsis. 18% of those will die. For every hour of delay in starting antibiotics, and that should be 10%, another 10% will perish. We have a problem in our hospitals that we can do something about if we stop and think about it and do something to change the way we act in our hospitals. One of the obvious ways is to wash our hands. These are some of the posters that have been used around the country on various Clean Hands Saves Lives programs which build on the WHO program. And I'm sure you're all aware of the five moments of hand hygiene now. Uh, we still struggle to get people to adopt those. In 2006-07, we adopted a program in New South Wales. And I just want to show you these two graphs for one very simple reason. The uh, pink line are the medicos. Okay. Before we started the program, you can see that they were down at 22%. Sorry, the uh, numbers have fallen off that graph. Uh, 24%, I beg your pardon. For hand washing before people saw the patient. When we had a look at what happened after people saw the patient, we found that doctors were 34%. More doctors wash their hands after they see a patient than before. What does that tell the patient? <laughs> You're the dirty one, not me. And we suddenly realised we had a real problem. People were not measuring what they did or even when they did it, and so they were getting things quite wrong. Today, there are figures released in New South Wales and the AIHW will be releasing the My Hospital data probably early next week, that says the national ben benchmarking for hand hygiene compliance ought to be 70%. 70%. That means it's OK for 30% of us not to wash our hands? I'm sorry, there's something wrong in our thinking, isn't there? At present, about 72% of clinicians actually wash their hands uh, in the Five Moments program appropriately. But in New South Wales, the figures today show that there were 17 hospitals well below benchmark, even though across the state we were doing pretty well, so we can pat ourselves on the back and say New South Wales is pretty good. But 17 hospitals aren't washing their hands even to a benchmark. And medical practitioners, we've done a lot with our campaign, but we are still unsafe. 61% do wash their hands, and that's a 14% improvement in 12 months. But nearly 40% still do not wash their hands. And yet we know that sepsis kills. Can you see that safety is actually becoming quite an issue for us to address as we look after our patients? But it's not just sepsis. Patients who deteriorate quietly, suddenly and unnecessarily on the ward are the subject of our Between the Flags program in New South Wales. Why have I linked that to sepsis? Because between 30 and 87% of these patients die secondary to unrecognised sepsis. 
The 87% figure comes from a paper in Italy, but commonly up to 60%. We failed to recognise the most serious risk to the life and well-being of our patients. In much the same way as we fail to recognise that speed is the most dangerous thing on our roads. But let me tell you another thing that happens in this particular program. When we measured the observations that our staff were taking on our patients before, during and after surgery, we found that uh, although respiratory rate's the most sensitive indicator of deterioration, it was only being recorded in 11% of patients. And no one did anything about it until suddenly we changed the charts and got people to record it. And suddenly we started to get some early responders and get some improvement. Who knows what this uh, ad's all about? This is a newie. Seatbelts, exactly right. If I get into the car with my grandkids and I say click clack, you know what they say? Front and back, because that's the old program. And it's ingrained in our whole family, click clack, front and back. I can't drive away uh, with my um, five-year-old in the backseat of the car until she tells me that everybody's got their seatbelt done up. You see, she's actually started to learn the message of safety and applied it preemptively to Papa's crazy driving. <laughs> We need to think the same way about surgery, where when we say something, everybody responds. So when we say, time out, everybody stops and says, yes. Have we got the right patient? Have we got the right operation? Have we got the right x-rays? And so on. And we need to involve everybody in the checklist. This is our seatbelt for safety when we're doing procedures. And we can develop similar checklists for other areas across our hospitals as well. And for those of you in the surgical colleges, I hope you know this backwards and that you do use it every time. And it's an inviolable process before you undertake a procedure on a patient. Let me give you one quick example. In our data on wrong site procedures, uh, three years ago, we found nine patients who'd been given a wrong intraocular lens in the space of about three months across um, eight area health services. In only one area health service had there been two. So each of the other area health services said, well, um, that's bad luck. We put the wrong lens in. One surgeon actually told the patient, well, look, I'm sorry, you'll just have to wear glasses, to which she said, but I had the operation so I wouldn't have to wear glasses. But when we looked at it more seriously, what we found out is we were lucky that there weren't uh, 10 times that many. Because what happened was that they did do a timeout. In every case, they did do a timeout. But the technician who bought the intraocular lenses from the company was not part of that timeout. He had a list given to him by the resident the day before of the cases on the list. What the residents forgot to tell him was in the middle of the night, Mrs. Bloggs had a fever and she was cancelled. So patient number three became patient number two, and so on down the chain. And fortunately, they recognised the mistake before any one of those operating theatres did too. You see, we've got to click clack front and back if we want to improve safety across the system. I don't need to tell you about this paper. This is a brilliant analysis of the effect uh, of the surgical checklist. There have been some detractors, of course. And they've admitted that there are some extra work to be done on overcoming some of the flaws in the paper. But what it basically says is that the rate of death at 1.5% was reduced to 0.8%, and that was a p-value of 0.003. Inpatient complications, 11% uh, down to 7%. We can make a big difference if we start to click clack front and back. The conclusions are there for you to read. Across a whole range of hospitals, a whole range of cultures, the checklist works. So why don't we use it? Another example. Transfusions are very common. It's been estimated in this country that 30% of blood transfusions after elective surgery are unnecessary and therefore dangerous. I can put up two or three slides in a row with a list of complications uh, of blood transfusions apart from things like HIV, Hep C, Hep B, uh, and pyrogenic reactions. Did you know that if you have coronary artery bypass surgery and you have a two-unit transfusion, you are significantly less likely 
to be alive in one year due to the blood alone and regression analysis? Did you know you are more likely to have a sternal infection if you've had a two-unit transfusion and that was the only abnormal factor? It's not safe. And if you do it unnecessarily, then patients will suffer. We did a program over a number of years, it's still going in fact, called Blood Watch. We actually tumbled to the fact that this actually had an economic benefit. As soon as we realised that, the chief execs came on side immediately. Yeah, we'll support this program. We'll make sure that the project offices are funded. Uh, and we started to get buy-in between clinicians and management. And we were able to achieve a 10% reduction in patient uh, in inpatient red cell transfusion after elective surgery in a non-bleeding patient. Huge savings for the management. Forget the money. Think about the patients whose health we had made a significant change. How do we do it? We developed some priority areas. We actually got some people to say, this is a crisis, we need to do something about it. We actually got the reporting systems working and we got the staff in the hospitals to do their own reporting. We gave them clinical governance support, we gave them education, and you'll notice there we included senior clinicians. We actually went to the market uh, analysis people and said, can you come and find out why people prescribe blood? They came back and said, we don't believe this. The senior surgeons and the senior clinicians don't know why they prescribe blood. They don't have any protocols. The junior clinicians are transfusing to what they believe was the protocol of the senior clinician. There was no gatekeeper, there was no communication. So we went back to the books and we found that there were some National Health and Medical Research guidelines, and these are they, the so-called bow tie diagram, which made it quite clear when you should transfuse and when you should not transfuse. And we circulated that to every single resident and intern, and we gave it to every registrar and we suggested they show it to their boss. And we did a red cell audit across all the hospitals. Firstly, we found that 12% of patients had anemia, had anemia uh, before they had the surgery. That could have been delayed. These were elective cases. 4% had transfusions when they did not need them. And 95% had a post-op transfusion uh, when they probably didn't need it. But we didn't know because they hadn't recorded the symptoms. And besides, everybody got two units as the first dose anyway. This graph uh, just shows you some of the changes. I'm not going to go through this in too detail. You can see the control limits. I'll just put those in for you. But if you have a look in the top right-hand corner, 27% of patients had no documentation as to why they were given a transfusion. How can you be safe if you don't know why you're doing things? Just move through this if I can quickly. Then we went to the hospitals and we took them by peer groups and we said, here are, in this case, nine peer groups. And we asked them, which one are they? Okay. And an amazing thing happened. Because 90% of the hospitals said, we're the second best. No one said they were the best. Well, you know, only two sort of right. But in fact, when we showed them their own figures, such as in Hospital 7 here, where they were giving 40% more blood than any other hospital, they were shocked. And their first comment was, we don't believe your data. To which we said, sorry, it's your data. If we want to change practices, we've got to get people to know that their speedo is recording the right speed. Because then they've got something to work with. And not only that, they can see the changes with time, which is even more important. We put out a whole lot of posters. Typical campaign, just like the RTA. Across every hospital, um, we put them out one at a time. They did a fantastic job until we put the last one up, which showed the cost savings. And they all said to us, we knew you were just interested in the money. So we pulled that off the series. We let people know and we kept reminding them of the safety issues. And look what happened here. This is the improvement by hospital compared to the previous year. The ones down the bottom that were the poorest performing hospitals. Uh, and they had improved by 14 and 8% uh, respectively. Uh, sorry, they were the lowest users of blood. But they were the best performers overall, but they still improved because they were measuring and they could see examples where they hadn't got it quite right. Those people that were using all the blood made dramatic changes.
because they wanted to play catch up. We were able to maintain that 10% reduction now for the fourth year. And we save approximately $2 million per year in direct costs. And as I mentioned, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what happens to the patients themselves. And then we introduced a transfusion question. To come back to that first slide I showed you with the statistics, to get people to ask the question, what's this all about? What can we do to improve our results? And you can go online and you can have a debate with the experts. Sorry, that one's a duplicate. The final thing I want to talk to you about is the problem with central line associated bacteremia. And these are figures, as you can see, come from the US reports. Uh, and you can see the costs of central line associated bacteremia. Dramatic. We wanted to change that. We already had a hand washing program. We introduced a few other ideas. But we sat down with the ICU teams and we showed them the work from Pronovos at Johns Hopkins and others. And we said, you come up with some programs to try and drive a change. And surprise, surprise, they came up with a checklist, a reminder, a prompt, a speedo to tell them how fast they're going now. And they filled this out. We had no money to give them for data recorders. They filled it out, they submitted it, they did the analysis. Some more detail. We then reviewed the data on over 10,000 line insertions. There was some training necessary on who could put in the central line. Credentialing, if you like. There's some real lessons here, because even the senior people had to go through this process. We had a look at where people did not comply, and I'm not going to go through this in time, uh, in detail. But you can see that the worst performer were people using uh, hats and masks. But when we had a look at the compliance and the outcomes as a response to compliance with a bundle that they had drawn up, some really interesting things happened. The relative risk of CLABS uh, was 1.62. For central lines, it was 1.99. For pick lines, it was 5.08. That's a bit of a worry. Dialysis catheters, we couldn't pick a difference. But if the staff were compliant about getting the patient bundle right, that's their skin prep, their positioning, uh, and so on and so forth, and they got their own bundle of care right, including the hat, the mask, and the eyes, uh, there is the... Uh, a risk rate was 0 0.6, and you can see the confidence intervals there. There were four hospitals who refused to wear hats and masks. They said it's nonsense in an ICU to get us to put a hat and a mask on when there's bugs floating around the ICU. We're not going to do that. We said, that's OK, but we're going to measure your data. There were four hospitals that were out the outside the confidence intervals for this study. They were the same four hospitals. They were unsafe. Why were they unsafe? Because they didn't wear a hat and a mask? I don't know. But I'm pretty sure it's because that they had a speedo and that something was triggering the other team to get everything right. This group said it doesn't matter. It's a bit like when you go at 65 k's down the freeway uh, or down the road, you think, that's OK, I've got away with that. I'll go 70 next time. And that adds significantly to the morbidity, as you know. Of course, people then say, look, it's got nothing to do with it. It's the roads. It's the complexity of healthcare. It's all the intersecting things that happen. We've got to do something about those. And here's some, a program that's happening across New South Wales about uh, railway crossings. Sorry, Chris. Um, because they're a very dangerous environment. But it's not just the roads. It's the fact that we like to maintain our professional autonomy and drive the way we want to drive when we want to drive. So maybe it's roads themselves that are not the answer. Maybe we need, maybe we need to think about alternate methods of transport, such as rail, which is guided by two immutable guidelines at any one point in time. So where's your autonomy? Oh. You get to choose where you put the patient in the guidelines that you know works. It was Admiral Bismarck who said, any fool can learn from his own mistakes, but a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. It was a much greater man in my eyes who added a third phrase. He said, but the true straight statesman will tell everybody of his mistakes in order that they're not reported are not repeated. <laughs> that man's name was Robert Hughes, and he was my father. Thank you.